Isn't it incredible? Look at those crystalline formations. They're fabaroo. Yep, Kachansky is still a nerd. You can probably tell us the average rainfall of the oil-rich coastal lowlands of Venezuela. No, I couldn't. Okay, 3.4 inches, so what? Not to be outdone, Crichton talks about his qualifications. Many years ago, I completed my course at Toilet University, where I studied the lavatorial sciences. Anyway, they've come across an ice-covered asteroid containing a starship, so they go to check it out. There's a woman in there! Where they find a woman who has been frozen. Apparently she's still alive, so they bring her on board. The temperature's been a constant 90 degrees, and yet she's still completely cold and unresponsive. What about Miss Carmen? Okay, that was funny, if only for Crichton's body language. Lister got a kick out of it, too. I was talking about Miss Carmen. In any case, they cannot get the ice to thaw. Recommend we wait until the chemical analysis results are completed in the morning, sir. Later that night, when no one is around, that's when the ice melts. <laughs> Meanwhile, Lister's asleep and... Yeah, this isn't gonna be pretty. Naturally, he assumes it's Kachansky because he's dumb. Oh, Smith! It's Crichton! For some reason, Crichton knows that someone is in there with Lister and makes the same assumption he did. She's in here, isn't she? I don't know what you mean, man. You promised me you wouldn't like her more than me! Ugh, the voice is back. Who? Miss Kachansky, who do you think? Anyway, Kachansky shows up, revealing that it wasn't her. Shame mode. <laughs> Yeah, that mode needs to be switched on a lot more often this season. But anyway, cue more awkwardness as Lister figures that she just climbed out of the shower through the vent shaft or something. We've got a little unfinished business! That was a long time ago! Things are very different now! And he's ready to continue. Does it the springs? <laughs> Not if you were the last man alive. I am the last man alive. I rest my case. So he goes back into the shower to get his duvet and finally figures out that wasn't Kachansky earlier. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Fun fact, she was wearing fake teeth that Craig Charles pulled out with his own teeth as a gag. And he went, hey guys, guys, look at this. But the creators liked it, so they kept it in. But it was never as funny as the moment he first did it, because I had no idea who was going to do that. When you don't know that, it looks like her tongue is coming off in his mouth, which is pretty gross. Anyway, shortly after, she dies. I've just been molested by Tutankhamun's horny grandma! She's dead, sir. But it turns out that she's been dead for three million years. So where were the life signs coming from? And more to the point, where did they go? Later on, Lister isn't feeling too well. Kachansky just thinks he's being a big baby, because of course she does. There's a foreign substance in your blood, and it's the epidemic virus, sir. So the epidemic virus was created to block nicotine cravings from reaching the brain, but it ended up blocking the brain's need for blood and oxygen. For the first 48 hours, it consumes its host, uh, then hijacks the corpse and goes looking for a new victim. Uh, when it can't find one, it freezes the body and waits. So the life signs they found didn't belong to the woman, but to the virus. I've been tongue hockey to death. But the virus is intelligent and Crichton knows of a way to communicate with it. And he thinks that maybe they can reason with it. I believe it's your only chance, sir. So Crichton hooks Lister up to the translator. And a great big hi to all of you out there in flesh and blood land. And it sounds like a game show host because Red Dwarf. Let's run down the rules. If you win, you get to live. Anyway, when the epidemic virus kills someone, it absorbs all of their knowledge. So it basically gets more knowledgeable with every victim. So as you can appreciate, killing you ain't exactly a career highlight. No offense, but when you're a virus, there's not much call for knowing how to open a lager bottle with your anus. Lister tries to reason with it, and it basically thinks of feeding off Lister is the same as Lister eating a chicken. I have certain qualities that elevate me above poultry. I can think. I can play the guitar. Better than a chicken? Are you crazy? Time for your species to check out, Davey. Only the dirty humies. So yeah, that didn't work out too well. So they have a rather drastic solution, but it might be Lister's only chance. The plan is to inject antivirals in a precise pattern through your body, forcing Epidem into your arm. And then you cut it off. Lister reluctantly agrees. But make it my left arm, okay? Because my right arm does all my favorite things. And heading for the left shoulder, 309.0. No, 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 308, 308! Anyway, they kind of screw up and the virus ends up in Lister's right arm, so they've got to amputate that. But the virus keeps moving away from it, so... Still not enough! 
Okay. Only Red Dwarf would be playing this for laughs. It's gonna be a cold day in hell before I touch barbecue wings again. So instead of having lost some of his left arm, he's lost most of his right arm. <gasps> what kind of navigation officer can't tell left from right? You did what you had to do to save me life. And it didn't even get rid of the virus, so it sucks to be Lister right now. 7% of Epidemus variants have found their way back into your body. They're currently multiplying exponentially. Anyway, while Crichton and Kachansky are bickering, Kat reveals that Lister is missing, along with some explosives. There could be a connection. Come on! It turns out that he's planning to go back to the ship where the virus came from and blow it up along with himself. At least I'll rob it the satisfaction of killing me. Hey there, you watch this, the Christmas special? Let's set the timer for five minutes, shall we? The rest of the crew want to stop him, but he's determined and kind of makes up a will on the fly. Chris, I want you to have the collection of songs I wrote about you. There's only two things that rhyme with Kachansky. I used Underpansky twice. Right? So you'll leave all me laundry. Keep it clean for me, man. Oh, sir. And Kat, you can have anything you want from my wardrobe. I love Kat's response. Great! I need some hangers. So Lister ends the transmission and goes back to talking to Epideme. The people of this ship kept searching for a solution right until the end. And gets it to spill some info. They even overloaded their engines. They were so near. They weren't running from something, but to something. Lister gets back on board Starbug and Crichton asks it for more info. How could Starbug's drive module be reconfigured to be made more efficient? Reroute the pulse relays via the auxiliary, conduct the nose and transpose all the brand numbers in the first line of the output to the energy equation. <sighs> the Leviathan was heading for Delta 7 for the Epidemic cure. Trouble was, by the time we reached Delta 7, I'd be dead. So Starbug has been upgraded, and it is on the way to Delta 7. Scanning surface. Oh my god. Except that there's nothing on the planet. You knew, didn't you? I had to do something to make Dave think there was hope. The whole planet was flamed to get rid of me. But I had already left in one of the Star Corps medical engineers. Kachansky seems to get an idea. Until then, good night. <laughs> Look at Crichton standing up straighter for the anthem. And now Kachansky returns to try something even more drastic. I'm gonna stop your heart, okay? What? What? She stops his heart, effectively killing him. The virus reanimates Lister, who bites her on the hand, apparently transmitting the virus to her. The long-running virus epideme has been renewed for another season! Wrong, Bughead. You're axed! I know I said it was a drastic plan, but Jesus. She... <laughs> it's always a good episode when Cat falls over. Have you gone completely insane? But nah, it turns out it wasn't her arm. It's Caroline Commons. I injected it with blood and adrenaline. That was pretty awesome. Go Kachansky. Even Crichton's impressed. But I really have to accept that I'm gonna have to eat some of my own hat. So much so that they just walk out of the room and forget about Lister. He's the Lister! <laughs> but they get back in time to save him. What's that for? For not staying dead. Aw. Germs. And so ends Epideme. As season seven episodes go, I think this one's pretty good. It's got a couple of the usual season seven bugs that I could do without, but the good outweighs the bad for me with this one. Of course, the highlight is the virus. Making it intelligent and giving it a fun personality is just such a red dwarf thing to do. Though apparently their original idea for the voice was to go with Patrick Stewart, who is a fan of the show. But with how dark the story is, they figured it'd balance out better if Epideme sounded more like a game show host, and therefore provided some comic relief. Honestly, the voice kind of reminds me of Audrey too from Little Shop of Horrors. Also, I love Kachansky kicking ass in the end. I'm never quite sure how I feel about her. On one hand, she's kind of stuck up, so I don't want to root for her, but... Part of the reason she acts like that is because the others give her crap about the fact that she's smart, so in a way I do kind of root for her, sometimes. Either way, she was brilliant here, so credit where it's due. Next up is Nanarchy. Yeah, I was originally going to cover both of these episodes in one video, but each kind of has its own focus, so I figure it'd be better to give each its own video. Also, it's the holidays and I'm short on time. See you then. Fuck him
my neck. A great big gob of ice water. And right down into me crevice. 